everyone. Um, welcome to another engaging training session for our CFO community addressing um, the new yellow book standards. Um, at the conclusion of each session, please complete the short evaluation form found in your welcome package and make sure that you return it to the registration desk before you leave. Um, for those seeking CPEs, a representative will be signing those forms at two tables outside of these doors. Um, sharing her insights today is our guest, Christian Kokolik. Did I say that right? Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, I am going to talk about our new government auditing standards, which we affectionately refer to as the Yellow Book because it's yellow. Um, does anybody know why it's called the Yellow Book? Has anybody heard the story? Yes. Exactly. That's exactly right. So it is intended to be the gold book, the gold standard of auditing standards. But yes, we were limited in printing color choices, so it became the yellow book and has stayed that way. If anyone is familiar with the green book, I don't have as good a story for the green book, the internal control standards, which you're probably also familiar with. Um, I don't know why that's green, but yellow does have a story behind it. Um, so. I think most of the folks in this room, from what I understand, are on the management side of the house, working in the CFO office. Um, but is there anyone in the audience who is an auditor and has to implement these auditing standards? No, okay, so we are an audience of management who gets to be affected by these auditing standards. Okay, very good, so I will try to tailor my comments about the changes to how they may impact you, what you may see your auditors doing differently or not doing differently. Um, a lot of times we're giving these types of presentations to the auditors who are actually out there doing the audits, um, but it's really exciting and refreshing to see that management wants to know about the standards too and what you can be expecting to see from your auditor. So, so thank you, thanks very much for having us. By a little way of background, I'm guessing you probably have biography, but um, I am a director at GAO in our financial management and assurance team. And so within that team, um, I think you've had some other folks earlier today from GAO as well talking about high risk list. Um, so I'm in the team that works on financial management and assurance. And we do um, all of the financial audits that GAO is mandated to do um, get done by our team. And so um, we do the consolidated financial statement audit, which everything feeds into. Um, and we also do a handful of other audits. So I have worked on the financial audit of the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So there are several entities within the federal government that GAO is mandated to do um, for various reasons. Um, but then lots of the other departments are done by, as you know, the OIG or um, independent public accountants who the IG contracts with. Um, so but any, any financial audits that GAO does are done in our team. We are also the team that has our standards group, which brings you the yellow book, the auditing standards, as well as the green book, which is our internal control standards. So are most folks familiar with the internal control standards? Hopefully, yes, very good. Um, that was issued not too long ago in 2014. Um, so I'll talk about how that interacts with um, the yellow book. Um, so I spent a lot of time, um, after working on some of those financial audits, transitioning and working in our standards team, um, actually working on the revisions to the internal control standards, and then moving on and working on revisions to the Yellow Book standards. Um, and now I've kind of moved somewhat out of the standards team and I'm working on uh, performance audits at the Department of Defense. So I've had a couple different things that I'm working on, but it all um, is really fascinating and it's helped me learn a lot. And I really like the aspects of GAO where we get to um, think about the standards, work on the standards, but then also do the implementation of the standards and actually go out and make sure they work well. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, like I said, the objective today is to really talk about revisions to the standards, how they may impact you. Um, I may try to throw in just some background also of understanding to the extent, are, have folks sat through kind of any yellow book training before? Have you had a past life where you're familiar with yellow book? Some yes? Okay, okay. Um, so you're familiar with the basic concepts. I can try to provide some um, background though too as to kind of where we've been helps shape where we go and why we made some of those revisions. So um, I'll try to factor some of that in. 
Um, so by way of background, when we go to update our government auditing standards, it is quite a lengthy process. Um, and so we do consider them to be generally accepted government auditing standards. And what does that mean that they're generally accepted? It means that it goes through a due process before we ultimately issue final standards, meaning that um, we have an advisory council that works with us. And so if you look in um, the back of the yellow book, we actually list all the advisory council members. Um, we want to make sure it's not just folks at GAO sitting around thinking up these great ideas for standards and then putting them out there. We need to um, get input from others. And so folks that sit on the advisory council include uh, people from public accounting firms, from the IG, from state auditors, from um, local government auditors, uh, because it's important to remember we use these auditing standards for all federal government audits, but they're also used by all state and local government auditors as well, for the most part that these are the standards that those folks use. Any entity that's receiving um, significant amount of federal funds who are required to have what's called a single audit or any kind of um, audit because they're getting federal funds, those audits are also being done in accordance with these standards. So um, they're actually used more widely beyond the federal government because it's, it's affecting every state, um, state government and local government. So they're really widely used, so we want to make sure we're incorporating input and thoughts from the federal government environment, but also certainly from state, local, other folks that are going to be impacted by the setting of these standards. So we try to cast a wide net to get as much input as possible. Um, and then after seeking input from our council, we issue what's called an exposure draft, where we put something out there um, that we think is what the revised standards are going to look like, but intending to seek feedback from folks that are going to have to use them. Um, and so we had put the revised standards out for public exposure um, in April of 2017, had a three month, I think it was 90 day comment period, um, and did get back 95 comment letters. So that was good and bad, um, lots of good input, um, but was a lot to go through. And we try to be really diligent in going through all the comments to make sure we consider everything. Um, and we're, we're accountants over at GAO too, so we make spreadsheets and analyze and categorize and, you know, destroy the data to death. Um, but, but at the end of that, we make revisions that we think should be made in response to those comments, meet one more time with the advisory council to kind of run through with them. Here's the comments we got. Here's how we're planning to address them. Does it seem like we're being responsive to comments? And then we issue the standards in final. Um, so going through that process, does it mean everyone's happy and loves the standards? Not necessarily, because as you can imagine, we're getting all that input. So person A may think we should do this, and person B may think we should do this. Um, so we really have to think through, um, given all of the, that input, what makes the most sense. Um, so it is quite a diligent, rigorous process. Um, it's not a fun process to watch, necessarily, uh, kind of sausage making. But in the end, hopefully, we come up with the right answer. Um, so these standards were issued um, final last July. So it felt like what felt like forever, and I felt like I was at conferences telling people, you know, for years, the, the new standards are coming, they're coming, they're coming. And it was very exciting last year when I could say, they're here, very exciting. Um, okay, so any questions about the process, how we go about doing our standard setting? No, okay, very good. Um, I'm gonna talk, like I said, about some of the key changes. And so these next two slides really just highlight some of the key topics that I'm going to, to cover. Um, the first one being new format and organization. Uh, the next one, independence threats, particularly related, related to preparing financial statements guidance for CPE requirements, competence of specialists, peer review requirements, quality control, monitoring of quality, internal control for both financial and performance audits, uh, new considerations for addressing waste, standards for reviews of financial statements, and management assertions. So that is kind of the high level areas where we made the most significant changes. And so that's what I'll focus on talking about um, today. The first thing that we changed, um, which seems like a pretty simple thing, but we've actually gotten really positive feedback from it, is just reformatting how we do the standards. So um, as accountants or as auditors, there are lots of requirements and standards that we need to follow. Um, and so it's most helpful when those types of standards are written in an easy to understand logical type format. 
Um, and so what we had been noticing is that um, in accounting and auditing standards, people were doing a really good job of kind of clarifying the way they write standards and making it really clear in the beginning of a section, these are the requirements followed by some, here's guidance that you may want to consider as you implement the standards. Um, so we tried to incorporate that into our new standards and people seem very happy with that. If you read um, our 2011 revision, um, when auditors would go through it, it kind of read like a novel, like, which was exciting because um, you didn't know where you were going. But every once in a while when you read through, you'd get to a requirement. You'd be like, oh, okay, I guess I should do that. But it wasn't clear. If you weren't paying attention, you could read right by our requirement. Um, and so we tried to make it more user-friendly to clearly label things as requirements. And that's kind of hard to see, but if you can kind of notice where there are boxes on the pages, those boxes have a heading of requirement, and that means it's a requirement. So something very silly, but we're trying to make sure that the auditors are able to actually identify what the requirements are um, and make sure they're not missing any. Um, okay. So these, this type of thing, the new format organization, for your purposes, I don't think you're gonna notice much of a change, right? Hopefully the auditors are just gonna be doing a better job of not missing any requirements, um, doing their audits well, but as far as a change you can expect to see, probably not. Um, and I guess that, I think that's the overall theme. Um, if I can give you one takeaway of, now that there's new government auditing standards, what can you expect your auditors to be doing differently? Um, if you have loved how your audits are going, you might be happy to hear that you probably might not notice much difference. Um, if you haven't been happy and you are hoping that this is going to be a whole new way of auditing, you might be disappointed because truly I think the concepts of how we go about doing, doing auditing are not drastically changing by these revisions. We're really just trying to, like I said, um, make changes to make it easier for the auditors to do a good job in, in doing their audits. Um, because one of the things we were trying to react to in doing these changes was um, there have been several studies done um, by AICPA and others who have received results that audit quality is maybe not where we would want it to be as a profession. And so you've probably seen some of those reports and certainly you know, going back many years to Sarbanes-Oxley and things like that, the CPA profession kind of was getting a bad rap for a while of, you know, why, why aren't they catching things? Why are companies having problems? Why aren't audits being done as well as they could be done? And so um, certainly changes were made um, through the Sarbanes-Oxley legislation, um, but we, we looked to at what can we put into our standards to help make sure that auditors are doing the audits properly, that they are properly following the standards. And so that was definitely something that was in our mind as we made all of these changes is, are there things we can incorporate into the standards to help drive audit quality? So truly, as an, as an underlying um, theme as to the changes we were making, that's really something um, that we were focused on. Um, and so something as simple as format of, okay, here's the requirements, make sure you follow them. Hopefully that will help auditors understand what they need to be doing. All right, the next thing, I wanted to talk about with the changes, and this is something that likely will not impact you all at all, but it's good to have some perspective, just kind of what's going on in the world out there. Um, and it has to do with auditor independence. And so really when you think about an auditor and you're getting an auditor's report, right within the title of that report, it says independent auditor's report. And what that's intended to mean is that you have someone coming in to do an audit of your financial statements who is not the same person who prepared the financial statements, right? So you all as management are preparing the financial statements. You have an auditor come in who, you know, has not prepared the financial statements and you kind of get an independent objective look so that users of those financial statements can have comfort that there ha they have been prepared in accordance with the applicable financial reporting framework. Um, and so, Underlying all of the standards that we have in Yellow Book is the fundamental concept of independence. And in the Yellow Book, how we talk about independence is um, a threats and safeguards methodology. So there could be an auditor who's going out to do an audit. They are supposed to be independent to do that audit, but they could potentially have a threat to their independence, such as they have a spouse or close relative who works at the entity where they're going to do the audit. Um, they could have a some type of bias threat to the subject matter they're going to be auditing. 
Um, if they were serving in a consulting type activity at the entity, they could potentially have a self-review threat to the extent that they are going to be auditing some of the things they helped management implement. And so there are lots of reasons that auditors could have um, a threat to their independence that they need to think about and uh, decide if there are some safeguards they can put in place um, to mitigate that threat so that they still could go ahead and do the audit. Well, not necessarily at the federal government level, but at small local governments, um, if you live in small towns, um, school districts, many times those types of organizations who are getting audits done in according with those standards don't have a large CFO shop. They don't have lots of um, accounting people working in their organizations who have the skills and knowledge and ability to do financial statements um, in accordance with the appropriate framework. So a lot of times those entities are actually following the GASB standards. So those are the standards for government um, audit entities, kind of except for federal government where we follow the FASAB standards. Um, so a lot of times those types of organizations, like I said, local government, school districts, they become pretty dependent on their auditor to help them make sure they are getting their statements done correctly. And so what we have found is there's a, a line that can tend to get crossed when your auditor is in there intending to, to be your auditor and to help you and do the right thing, but at some point crosses that line to really making management decisions and really becoming part of preparing the financial statements, at which point losing some of their independence. And so to the extent that there are requirements that these entities are getting audits done in accordance with government auditing standards, which requires you to be independent, and they're doing this type of financial statement preparation assistance, it becomes problematic. Um, and so what we have found is that there are times where likely folks out there in that world are, are you know, necess not necessarily independent to do, these, to do these engagements. And so what we tried to do is put some additional documentation requirements in the standards because what we have found is that if people are forced to write down their rationale for doing something, you tend to think about it a little more carefully. So if, if there's a requirement to just consider whether you're independent, if you think you are, move on, and that's what the requirement was, there was no documentation requirement, okay, well, I thought about it, I thought I was good, and I moved on. Okay, when someone else comes in behind you to look at, well, what thought process did you go through? I, I, I watch you prepare these financial statements and then audit them. How did you reach the determination that there was not a threat to your independence? It's not documented, so it's hard to kind of double check how someone went through that thought process. So what we have added um, in this particular area are some documentation requirements. So if the auditor is going through the thought process of, yeah, I'm kind of in the world of preparing financial statements, helping them pretty significantly with preparing them, and then I'm going to be their independent auditor, I need to write down the thought process of how I got comfortable um, with doing that. So we're hopeful um, that that will drive some change, drive some um, more maybe diligent thinking and ways that they may be able to uh, put some things in place to make sure they are independent. So any questions on that? Like I said, it's not generally a federal government issue, um, but to the extent entities that you work with are getting grants and they might be small, it's something to be aware of for audit reports that as federal government, uh, federal man financial management people, if we're looking at other reports from smaller entities, something we want to be making sure that they are following the standards correctly. Um, so again, this is a, a flow chart that we had added that really um, helps the auditors think through where they are, what threats they might have for preparing financial statements and how to think through that. So likely you will not have to use that, but just good to know. Auditors should be. Um, okay, so this is kind of what, this is a slide is what I talked about of safeguards that people could put in place. So um, the category that financial statement preparation falls into would be considered a non-audit service, right? So um, CPAs or auditors perform audits, but we also have skill sets where we might be asked to do non-audit services, such as consulting, um, help, we could be asked to help prepare financial statements with another auditor coming in to do the independent audit. <clears throat> so that's what I was talking about. Those likely 
can create threats to independence if you have an auditor who is doing a non-audit service and then also doing the audit. And so we've added some additional examples um, into the Yellow Book for auditors to think through, okay, if I have this type of threat, what are some things I could put in place to mitigate that so that I could still be independent to do the audit? Um, we are, try to be pretty clear that we don't have an explicit list in here. It's ideas, you may do something else, that would, that would be just fine, it doesn't have to be listed here, but get people thinking about what they could do. For example, if someone had a personal independence threat, such as you have a spouse, close family member, something like that, and you're in a large enough audit organization, you could just have another auditor work on the engagement. So, so it can be something as simple as that, um, but depending on the threat, the safeguard will, will um, change. Um, this, I've, this really hasn't changed. It's just explaining that as part of an audit, so if you have your auditors um, visiting you from time to time and they are um, getting you up to speed on new standards that have been issued or you're just having conversations through the course of the audit where they're saying, oh, we'll make sure, you know, have you seen this new standard or have you thought about doing things this way? Those are considered kind of routine parts of the audit. It's not necessarily a non-audit service. It's things that you would expect to happen um, during an audit um, that does not cross over into a concern for non-audit services. So again, we tried to add some examples in there to help auditors think through okay, when am I doing something kind of just routine, part of the audit that's not a problem, versus when might I be crossing a line and really have to think about it. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention with independence has to do with some specific um, guidance we put in there for uh, auditors who work in government. So there are folks who do audits in accordance with government auditing standards, such as the independent accounting firms, like KPMG, I think, does the DHS um, audit. But then you have the IG, who also does audits of the federal, uh, federal entities. And so auditors who are in those federal-type government organizations, like IGs, like GAO, um, we may be out there doing a financial audit or a performance audit, but also doing an investigation. And we used to get a lot of questions from auditors of saying, is that something that impairs my independence? Because I'm out doing an audit, but I'm also doing an investigation. Is that a problem? And so we wanted to make it clear that no, that's not a problem at all. You're not doing either of those things on behalf of management. It's not really, you're not um, preparing things for them. You could be doing different types of audits and investigations, and that's, and that's fine. So we added that, that second bullet there, paragraph 372, was intended to answer some of those kinds of questions that auditors within government organizations may have. Um, and just hopefully you have all these slides. By way of reference, just if there's a paragraph number behind it, that is the paragraph in the yellow book where you can find um, more information about that if you need to follow up on anything. All right, so any questions up through independence concerns? Yes? Ordinarily, I would say no, but of course, every situation for an independence threat is facts and circumstances based. So if because someone's working on an investigation and it creates um, a bias threat maybe or something, that potentially maybe could factor in. But ordinarily, if you're doing an investigation and an audit of this subject matter, generally that would not create a threat to auditor independence. But I don't know, did you have a, like, more? Bias, okay. So it could, um, and, and so you'd have to think that through. Um, but you're right, like if you know, if you gain additional information or know things, it could potentially um, give you a bias that could be an individual threat that you'd wanna think about. And so management of the audit organization may just decide we're not gonna have the same person do it, and that may be something that could um, mitigate that threat, depending if it is something individual. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay, good. All right, anything else? Okay, so the next area I wanted to move into is CPE. So I think for coming to these sessions, we are getting continuing professional education requirements to the extent you need them. Um, are most folks in here like certified public accounts or things like that that you need CPE for? Some, yes. Um, do you also have your own? Um, Education requirements at DHS? I'm not sure. 
of what people, no? Okay, okay. But for a variety of reasons, for licensing reasons, you may need to get education requirements just for maintaining competence to do your job, it might be a good idea to get continuing professional education requirements. Um, and so we have continuing professional education requirements within government auditing standards. Um, this is an area where, as I mentioned, we tried to make changes to improve audit quality. Putting the changes that we um, made in continuing professional education are all with the mind to try to improve audit quality. Um, because what we were finding is that, um, not necessarily at the federal level, but again, kind of at the smaller entity levels, especially, and folks doing single audits, small accounting shop, or small accounting firms who are doing these types of audits, don't necessarily always have the competence that they really should have to perform government audits because um, many of those small firms perform one or two government audits a year and, and they just don't have the experience. And while the government auditing standards are similar to the standards put out by AICPA and other, audit or audit, other auditing standards, they're not exactly the same. And so there are some differences that if you aren't trained in them and don't understand them, you could likely miss. And so, like I said, AICPA had done some, some studies and focused on government audits in their studies and found some pretty disappointing results in the quality of audits done in accordance with government auditing standards. And so that really struck home with us and we thought, you know, what can we do to make sure these audits are being done better? I'll get to that we have peer review requirements in here and I'll talk about what those are um, and how that changed. But the hope is that if an auditor does a poor audit through their own monitoring of quality or through a peer review inspection, problems within their quality control system hopefully should be identified. Um, but what the AICPA was finding is that the auditor was doing a poor audit and when the peer reviewer came out to check, they also weren't catching the problems. And so um, that's, that's not a good place for us to be as government auditors. We want the public to especially be able to trust audits of government entities, entities that are spending taxpayer dollars um, that have a requirement to have an independent audit, we want them to be done well. We want people to be able to rely on those audit reports that say how their taxpayer dollars are being spent. Um, and so we spent some time thinking about how can we change really the competence requirements, um, which include continuing professional education requirements to drive behavior, to make sure if someone is out there doing an audit in accordance with Yellow Book, they have they know what the yellow book is. They've seen it, <laughs> they've hopefully read it, um, but they're aware of the differences in those standards. And so um, what we tried to do is add some more guidance about what types of CPE should they be taking. So by a little way of background, when we had issued the exposure draft, so I talked about we um, put an exposure draft out and get feedback. In our exposure draft in this area, we had proposed implementing a CPE requirement to require auditors to specifically get training in yellow book standards. Seems pretty common sense, like if you're gonna do a yellow book audit, you should have training in yellow book. Well, we met with much, much resistance on that type of requirement. Um, and it was kind of interesting, it was kind of all over the board that people felt like that was way too prescriptive and didn't like the idea of having to be dictated so strictly as to what type of continuing education they have to take. Um, so we were kind of surprised that we got such broad disagreement in that. Um, so we went back and thought about, okay, how can we get this idea in here without um, having that specific requirement? Because it, I'll step back a minute. The reason it's important to have these requirements in the yellow book itself is because lots of people who do government audits are not CPAs, are not um, licensed in any fashion. So if, they, if their audit organization that they're working in does not have a required 
um, continuing education requirement, they, they won't have one. And so while lots of people are CPAs and already have requirements and are fairly consistent with what we have in Yellow Book, there's a large population of folks who are not licensed and absent these Yellow Book standards would not have any sort of continuing education requirement, um, which we wanted to make sure was not the case. Anybody doing these audits, we want to make sure is continually being updated on auditing standards. Um, so like I said, so we, we put the idea in to have a specific requirement on Yellow Book. People didn't like that. Uh, so we took a step back and thought, okay, if we're not gonna specifically require a certain number, um, how can we still make the point? So we went back and looked at our competence requirements. So that's what I was saying. What we really wanna make sure is people who are doing the audits are competent to do their audits. And so um, there is a requirement in the Yellow Book that has been in there and we have kept in saying an auditor must be competent to do the audit. That requirement hasn't changed. Um, and so we feel pretty comfortable that we have, there is an expectation that auditors are competent to do this audit. Now, how do you go about getting competent to do an audit? Does it have to be through sitting here for four hours and me talking about the yellow book, are you now competent to do a yellow book audit? Uh, probably not, right? So in some ways you can get their point of, well that's kind of an arbitrary, no, you know, requirement to say, okay, you're gonna get four hours and now, we, now you're competent. Like, how did we come up with four? How did we, you know? So in thinking about it that way, it does seem kind of arbitrary to have a number of hour requirement for Yellow Book. So in thinking that we have a must requirement to be competent, how people go about doing that, maybe we can be okay with them using some judgment and, um, in determining how they go about getting that competence. So certainly getting these types of classes, getting CPE is one way you can learn about Yellow Book, but on the job training, actually doing some Yellow Books, um, getting a degree, all of those types of things, we don't disagree, also make you competent to do a Yellow Book audit. So where we kind of compromised is that we have added application guidance to the CPE requirement to say, basically to the effect of, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get some training in Yellow Book, especially in years where there are changes to government auditing standards. So that's kind of where we ended up. We're not as prescriptive in the how, but we are very um, strict in the must be competent. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this slide. This is really just a summary of um, the CPE requirements that auditors have to follow. So hopefully all of the government auditors that you come in contact with are well-trained and competent to do the work that they are doing. Um, but, but anyway, it's intended to make sure that on an ongoing basis, the auditors who are out there doing these audits are competent to do them. Um, the other thing we did add, which I won't spend too much time on, is the competence of specialists. Um, I'm sure probably in some of the audits at your organization, the auditors are using some specialists um, to assist them. Um, and so we did add some additional guidance for how auditors need to think about how their specialists that are helping them are also competent. So, um, like I said, we did add some requirements there. All right, any questions on competence, continuing professional education, that area? No, okay. So really now when your auditors come out, they should be like super knowledgeable and really know what they're doing, oh, okay. The next area I wanted to talk about was, is peer review. Are folks familiar with the concept of peer review at all? Have you looked at the peer review report for your auditors? Sometimes, no? Um, well, you could, <laughs> if you want to. If you wanted to know how they're rated, you could look at that. So, like I said, there is a requirement within government auditing standards, which is not new. We did just make some tweaks, but that any audit organization that is doing government 